Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I'm Robert uh, Jarrett from Temple University. Um, we're extremely grateful uh, to this fourth uh, delegation um, to come. Uh, we've had uh, the pleasure to host uh, similar delegations for several years, and it's always, I think, the most moving and the most interesting event that we run at Temple University uh, every year. Um, you obviously came to hear them, not me. Uh, you have uh, the biographies of the speakers. Uh, each of them will give a short introductory statement for maybe about five minutes, and then we'll uh, take uh, questions from the audience. So thanks again. So.
he uh, spent. Uh, yeah, you hold it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he uh, always said that he wouldn't take anything for the experience he had, but he wouldn't go through it again for anything in the world. I think I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> My name is Bob here. Now here is a German name and a German word, and what it means is army. I was soon to find out the fate that I would be facing after I graduated from high school. A week after I graduated from high school, I joined the Army Air Corps at Marchfield, California, in Riverside. Anyway, I never expected to get overseas to the Philippines. That was the last thought I had in my mind. But, uh, well, here I am after a little tour there. But uh, uh, my career was very interesting. I spent uh, three and a half years in the Japanese prison camp. And I was at eight different POW camps in, Man in the Philippines. And that included a stint of two and a half prison camp or two three prison camps on Taiwan and three prison camps on Hokkaido. So here I am. Uh, I finally retired in 1945 and uh, then a month later I came back into the service because I had missed the service and I really enjoyed it. I was a photojournalist in the Air Force and worked on base newspapers. And uh, uh, I was sorry about one thing, being a photographer, because uh, I entered Air Force contests for the sake of getting that promotion, and I was given honorable mentions for the many roles I won as first place during a particular year, 1956. Anyway, uh, that was one part of my career. Then. Uh, my second career, I, uh, I retired in 1961 and, uh, sorry, 1966. Then uh, I decided to work for the United States Post Office and I worked for them for 18 to 20 years. Then I started my third career and you'll never guess what it was. No. I became a house husband. <laughs> and I just made sure that I, I did the laundry, made the beds, kept the house clean, made sure dinner was on the table, and didn't have a headache. Because <laughs> we were newlyweds. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I, I had many various experiences as a prisoner of war. I was in eight different POW camps. I was in uh, two in the Philippines. I was in three different camps on the island of Taiwan. I was in three different prison camps on the island of Hokkaido. And... Uh, How much did you weigh? The scales didn't even move when I got on. <laughs> I'm not sure. I had to weigh about 124, 125. Thank you very much. <laughs> but anyway, I was very pleased to be able to come to Japan on this particular trip because uh, I'm amazed, I am truly amazed at the progress that the Japanese people have made. It almost makes me ashamed to be American. They're so far ahead of us, but pathetic. The buildings, uh, I wondered, well, maybe I should give a name to each one of the buildings, but then I ran out of names. And they're so, they're so tall, I got a sore neck trying to see the top of them. But uh, we're very impressed, my wife and I are very impressed by the city and the carefulness of the drivers. The courtesy they extend to each other, walking down the street, driving, riding buses, and so forth. And uh, I says, well, I wish I could take a little bit of that back to me. Maybe I will. 
but uh, uh, I may be rejected by Americans for having such outlandish ideas as to be polite, like you folks are here in Japan, and to, uh, to be as ambitious. And I will say that you must have a wonderful group of engineers that live in this country to build these structures as high and as sound as you do. And uh, with that, I think I'd like to close, and I want to thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. My name is Esther Jennings. I'm representing my husband, Clinton, who was a POW. I live in San Francisco. Anybody been there? Cable cars, Golden Gate Bridge, Alcatraz? <laughs> I am going to read uh, what I read at the press club. So. A Jennings, uh, California native, served in the Civilian Conservation Corps before enlisting in the U.S. Army in 1941. He was sent to the Philippine Islands the same year aboard the USS Republic. He was stationed on Corregidor to join Battery K, 59th Coast Artillery Regiment, where we helped man 60 inch searchlights, number one through eight, plus a number of 60 inch and 30 inch mobile seacoast searchlights. He was surrendered by General Wainwright on 6 May 1942. He was, people, um, mistake a lot of times. The men did not surrender. They were ordered to surrender. That does make a difference. He, uh, let's see, sorry, okay. He was sent to a series of POW camps in the Philippines, Bonga Bong, Cabana, Tuan, Lipa City, and I'm getting with my love. In July 1944, he was herded among the 1,600 other American POWs aboard the hell ship Nisuyo Maru to be shipped to Japan. The nightmarish two-week voyage to Moji, Japan, included an attack by an American submarine wolf pack on the unmarked transport. Jennings was the first first held in, and I, I may be pronouncing these names wrong, uh, Hirayama Mine, the company was dissolved in 1969, but its exploration and research division became independent as Mayesia Consultant Company Limited in 1965, and it still exists. He was then transferred to Fukuoka No. 9B, located near the town of Miyaka, now the city of Miyawaka, again to be slave labor in, um, in a mining coal, mining coal, but a slave labor in the mining area. He spent 25 years in the army after that. And I, um, I appreciate your interest, because I'm all interested in you. What are you doing here? <laughs> I'd love to hear more about it. Thank you very much for your interest. My name is Irvin Johnson. I enlisted in the Army Air Corps when I was 19 years old in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I went to uh, boot camp in Barksdale Air Force Base in Freeport. Uh, I was sent to Savannah, Georgia. And uh, after that, I helped load uh, equipment on a crew train and we were sent over to San Francisco. We left San Francisco November 1, 1941 and uh, uh, arrived in Manila uh, November 20, 1941. Uh, I was uh, Christmas Day the uh, outfit that I was in, the 27 bomb group, the 48th material squadron, uh, our, our cooks had a, uh, a beautiful dinner uh, fixed for us, and uh, since it was Christmas Day, but uh, the Japanese planes came over, and uh, we didn't have our Christmas dinner, so. Uh, they took us and put us on a, on a ship. We went over across Manila Bay to Marabellas in the uh, southern tip of Japan. 
and uh, then they, uh, I, I was put into a uh, second uh, uh, a uh, second provisional infantry. Uh, here I was an, an air corps man, had no infantry training. Uh, they gave us uh, uh, WW1 rifles that were still in Cosmoline in uh, Greece, and we had to clean all the grease off of it. And uh, my infantry training was go out and shoot five rounds, and that was it. So uh, we were put on the second line of defense on the can. And uh, April 9th, 1942, the uh, front lines broke, and uh, then the Japanese came right through the second line, and we all wound up back around Marvellous. And uh, uh, we, was, we were surrendered. And we didn't surrender, but we were surrendered. Uh, then the Japanese put us in, in groups, uh, probably about 150, <coughs> with uh, Japanese guards. And we started uh, the, this uh, so-called death march. Uh, I understand why they call it that, because there were so many, uh, so many soldiers that were killed uh, along this death march. Uh, we, we started out the first day, and uh, about halfway during the day, there were uh, about 50 uh, Filipino uh, prisoners that the Japanese had taken, and they put them right in the middle of the road and shot them all, and uh, then they ran over their bodies with their trucks and their tank tanks, and uh, so we had to walk by that. And we, you know, it wasn't a good sight to see. Uh, so we walked uh, 60, 65 miles in six days. Uh, we were put in uh, lots in, in vacant areas where uh, we were made to sit down it was so close we had to sit back to back and they gave us the sun treatment and just to sit there for hours in the sun without hats. Well, it, uh, it gets pretty hot in the, in the Philippines, so uh, it, it wasn't anything that we liked. So uh, then they would make us get up and we'd walk through the night, all night long. And uh, one night it rained and we had to continue walking in the rain. And uh, so uh, the next day we were going through a Filipino barrio, and they had this, uh, this uh, Filipino woman, uh, she tried to take some, uh, some rice and wrap it up in banana leaves, and uh, they would, they would throw, it, throw it to the guys that were marching, because they hadn't given us any, all, all we had was one cup of rice the whole time we were marching. And so she tried to, she tried to, uh, she, she was carrying a baby in her arms and she made the mistake, instead of throwing it, she walked out and tried to give it to one of the, one of the men and the guard saw her and he pulled the baby away from her and threw the baby on the ground and he bayoneted her, then he bayoneted the baby. 
Um, well, she, she died right there. And uh, so we, we just kept marching and we got to Camp O'Donnell, which, one of, which was uh, probably the worst camp uh, in, the, uh, in the Philippine Islands. And we had to uh, go out. I found out that if you went out on a detail, that the Japanese would give you just a little bit more food because it, they figured if you went out and worked that you deserved a little more food than if you stayed in the camp. So uh, that's what I did. I, tr I tried to volunteer for details and go on out and uh, try to get more food. Well, uh, in October of 1942, we left they took us and put us on a ship and the Totara Maru and they, we went up to, we went up north to Formosa and from uh, Formosa we started further north and turned around and came back because uh, I understood that there were uh, American submarines in the area. So we stayed there about a week and uh, then we start north again, and we got oh, uh, not too far out where uh, we saw two torpedoes coming right at the boat. Uh, the Japanese captain turned the boat sideways and saw one of the torpedoes went right along the side, and the other torpedo must have been a dud or something because it, it just it just sank and well they took us up to uh, the southern tip of Korea to Busan and put us on a, a train and took us up to Moulton, Manchuria uh, which is uh, probably about uh, 150 miles north of, uh, of Busan and it was pretty cold when we got there, November 11, 1942. It was, uh, it was about 10 degrees below zero. And uh, we had to, after being in the Philippines in this uh, hot climate, it was, it was kind of hard to get used to this cold so fast. And a lot of people died that night. Well, we were, I was a, in a group that was assigned to work at a uh, machine tool factory. And we had to walk about four and a half miles uh, every day uh, from, from this camp to the, to the factory. And then four, four and a half miles back to the camp in the evening. And, uh, well, uh, we just we worked uh, we worked there until the end of the war uh, and August uh, I think it was August the seventeenth uh, the the Russians came in and liberated us and uh, they came into the camp told us that we were free and. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, that's uh, quite a feeling to feel free again. But you don't really, you couldn't really feel it until you got in American control where you could see that uh, stars and stripes. Because we got awfully tired of seeing that big red dot on the flag. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, after then, they, they took us down to the, the, the port of Dairen and uh, took us to uh, 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 not Formosa. Hmm? 
pounds. Oh, how much did I weigh? I weighed about 125. My husband was 89 pounds. Well, that's good. <laughs> or it's not so good. <laughs> anyway, they took us back to uh, back to Manila, put us on a ship. We landed in uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, they uh, put put us on a uh, hospital train. Took us down to San Antonio, Texas and uh, Brooks General Hospital at Fort Sam Houston. And after a while, uh, I got some leave, got on a plane, and flew back to New Orleans and met my family. So I, I, I think that's all I'll have to talk about. Jean McGroom, and my husband was Alfred, and he was in the three C's um, for a year, and then uh, he signed up for the service, and they took him from straight from Ohio to California and put him on a ship, and he went to the Philippines and was in Manila, and then on the island of Corregidor, which is out in the mouth of the Manila Bay. And uh, he said it was kind of like a heaven until the war started. And then when the war started, they really got bad. And uh, of course, when Bataan fell, um, the Corregidor, where he was at, uh, fought for five more months. Uh, they were bombed and strafed every day, every day. It didn't matter. And sun or rain. And then what then he was taken prisoner um, and um, he worked on an airstrip in the Philippines for two solid years with pick and shovel, making a airstrip for the Japs. And um, then from there on, he went, uh, went on a hell ship up to Japan. And when I say hell ship, it was because they put all the men down in the hole and shut the door. No oxygen could get in. And you set one up against another. And sometimes you didn't even have room to sit and to stand until some of them got smart and made little uh, beds from their blankets and that left a little more room and then they swept the ships with the submarines all the way up to Japan but he was fortunate on that one not to take too long and then he was from one camp to another camp and his last camp was up in northern <coughs> northern Canada. Japan, <coughs> excuse me, in Suwa, which is near Chino. And that one wasn't so bad. The one in the Philippines, the airstrip, it was very bad and they had very bad treatment and very little food. And um, then when the war was over, he um, it was finished, and then he went down to Okinawa, and then they shipped him down to the Philippines. And from the Philippines, he got on a boat and went back to the States. And uh, he would talk about it uh, once in a while, and I did not know him at that time. And so then we got married. And I didn't know he had been a POW until he went to get some insurance. And uh, they told him he couldn't have but $500 at, at a time because he could not pass a physical, having been a prisoner of war. And so uh, we just struggled with it and then bought some at a time and another at a time and, and went on and erased two children, and um, uh, 
We were married for 27 years, and then I lost him. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> Marvelous landscape. I was born in southwestern Minnesota, a little town called Lakeville, in 1922. I went to my all my grades in school and graduated from high school in 1940. In 1940, in our time, we were just coming out of the depression, and and, and the Germans and Britain were having a lot of problems with new that eventually, in not too long time, we would probably be involved. So, in March of in 1941, I joined the United States Marine Corps. Went basic training, I would do some guard work in San Francisco. In San Francisco, we went out to Guam in September. I got out there in September 41. Um, it was only about 400 servicemen out there, Marines and Navy. As Guam at that time was, they, they got mandated to World War I for some reason. And uh, there was about 20,000 Samoans out there. And it was governed by the Navy. And the Navy had the hospital out there, which took care of these Guamanians. So that was the biggest part of the personnel. Okay, we. And I'm going to skip the rest of my time in wartime, so you know, you know, where we become educated after we come home and uh, under the uh, uh, GI Bill of Rights, I become involved in automotive business. I worked in repair of automobiles, and then. Eventually went into dismantling automobiles. I dismantled automobiles for 31 years until 1981. But I did an awfully lot of service work. I started in 1952 working with disabled American veterans and different things, helping service people out uh, along with my work. Then 1981, I sold my business and then continued service work with department commander for DAG in Wisconsin in 1981-82. Um, I uh, worked in a Sears catalog store until they quit giving you a catalog. It was a good job. And then I worked at Walmart. I, I tell you, I, I retired when I was 59 years old, so I had a lot of, a lot of uh, work to go to. Give you an idea of what you can do or you have to. Yes. Um, we need to go with that. Okay, thank you. And I appreciate being here. I appreciate being with you people. Uh, it's the first time we've been back here since in about 70 years. But I, I was on in the island of Chicago for the length of the war because we were taken prisoner on the 8th of December, 1941. And we were left here until September 15th, 1945. Uh, thank you all. I'm not about everybody else. Get lazy and sleepy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
I was shown out. Mm -hmm. We did about eight or ten of us were in the same ship. <coughs> you know, you know, people really had to realize it. That wall was just around the corner when I left. And uh, so all that time, the Japanese was scheming on us, on our military. I guess we were a little too easy for us. Didn't give us enough time to really get in there. I was an infantry, so I didn't mess with the guns in my whole life. But when I got home with that machine gun, I had a heyday because I don't know she wasn't looking at me. I was sitting in the man behind it, seeing the gun, and I was going in the back. Give me some orders. So I could cut loose with this. And he said, I was kidding. I said, I'll be here. He said, see if I learn what he said, where I go. And he gave me some of the orders, and I did it. There he come back and said, what y'all doing? I said, well, I'm teaching him how to shoot a gun. I thought he just jumped in the head too, so. But you know, people, there's time in life that you have to ready to come down to earth and listen to your instructor or teachers, whatever it is. And I never mess with guns my whole life, all that. Because uh, I went out and looked for my dad and uncles, but they make me carry a little tote bag thing to put a game game in those squirrels and, and uh, season, bird season time. But I really, really nervous to be a hunter. But when I got old and seen it, it's just like a toy to me. And I mean, put rage on it. And that man who was teaching me said, I want you to be my number two and number one man. He said, and then I can tell you what to do. He said, you think them guys will take me in? And I was in the only American in the training in California. That's what I had a bit of a mirror out, but still in the hall. Whatever it takes, I said, I, I, I said to myself, that I'll go. So I did go to California and I took my basic there. But it's kind of rushing, rushing on or something, I don't know. I didn't, I, I couldn't kind of think of what I said, but now it seemed like it. Every time I lay down, I have a dream that we're sailing out in the ship dock and, and showing up in about another three or four days. So let's get our gear and whatever your parts and pain is. You're going to need all of that, but what you like to wear, what you, you get it, and what we'll you take that. I can tell you the building. So uh, I never mess with the guns. I know, but my uncle wanted to even look at one. It's still in law. It's a safety of uh, children that. My uncle thought I had his guns up a little, a little door, up a door, up on top, like that said, but he had some little hooks made and he, he hanged his gun around the rock up to it. But I said, I said, one thing people got to do is take the shells out. He said, well, how are we doing? I said, I'm glad you told me that. So, well, I was safe to let him. I don't know how to do it, but anyway, uh, I guess I'll just put it on here, of course. But I did it overseas. I mean, that's what machine gun I never liked that at all. But I like that. Uh, you said that's it, okay, I'll quit. That's what it would take to May I say something? This man here is one of our American Indian from the Indian tribe. And my husband told me a story about them when they were, uh, the Japanese got smart and they could translate English. And so these fellows have a language all of their own, the Indian language. And so they got to speaking in their own tongue so the Japanese wouldn't know what they were saying or what the orders were. And he said, we were all very proud of them for their own language and fighting so hard. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> uh, a little time for, for questions.
So we'll circulate the microphones. If you could just identify yourself and make your questions very brief, because I think we'll end around 8 o'clock, right? There's an organization you you can pick up on your internet. It's called NARA dash AAD. And it gives all the records of all the POWs and where they were in the Far East. It's you can just remember those six words. NARA N A R A dash A A D. Sorry, it was seven words. But you'll get all kinds. Of you'll get all kinds of information about American POWs on that uh, website. My name is Mike Stensrud. I'm from Oregon, back in the U.S. And uh, I had a question about forgiveness after the war. I mean, it sounds like some of you were in some real extreme situations, especially you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, you know, the death march and all that. When did you finally let go, or when did you, when did you agree to come to Japan, you know, and not look at them as your enemy forever, or if you have you even made that transition? I'm just wondering when, when you finally overcame whatever you experienced. Well, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I haven't overcome it completely yet, but. Uh, that was a different generation than what you have now. And most of the present generation uh, is not in their history books. And they don't, they don't know, a lot of them don't even know anything about it. So uh, I, 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 never, I never dreamed of coming back to, of coming to Japan because this is the first, this is my first trip here. But uh, uh, it's been it's been 70 years, and the the time of nightmares and stuff like that is uh, that phase has passed, and I I don't get any of that anymore. So uh, with with the advent of television and uh, all the way news travels around the world now that uh, I've, I've seen how beautiful uh, you all have re rebuilt uh, your cities. Uh, you're very technically advanced and uh, also, the, from what from what I've seen, uh, there's practically no crime, and of course, this is a big plus. So, when I got the opportunity to come to Japan, uh, I jumped at it, and that was it.
my name is Sato, and my father is still alive at age 91, living in the uh, northern part of Japan where uh, the big earthquake happened. And I had a chance talking to him last night. And we frequently talk about the war of his experience. Yeah. And uh, he just wanted me to convey his message to this occasion that in all, oh, this is my fourth attendee to this kind of the opportunity talking or meeting EOW, the fourth. And I, every time I have this opportunity, explain it to him what they said. And he said that there was one thing he, from the bottom of his heart, like to apologize. That is hellship. He couldn't even imagine how bad it was. And he sweared that he didn't know anything about that. So this was the biggest difference, that he didn't know and he couldn't imagine how bad it was. And just forgive us, he said. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Sendo, and I'm from Sendai. So, Mr. Ku, uh, you had a bad dream in Sendai, so I apologize also to you. To yeah. I'm from Sendai. So you yeah. And and I'd like to say feeling about his Mr. But why don't you <coughs> sue the, our government, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Abe? He's uh, in now, uh, fortunately, in his prime minister position. So most of the Asian countries, women prostituted by the Japanese military were now in charge of our government. Why don't, why don't you why don't you sue our government? Okay. <laughs> why in, not? in 1951, President Truman <laughs> President Truman gave away the rights of uh, Americans suing. So 1951, President Truman. But 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 people in the Asian countries, uh, the government Asian countries, same thing. But the people of the Asian mm -hmm. country sue. Well, I, I do know in San Francisco we have four lawyers from Los Angeles. We went up to court and there was a, a judge, Vaughn Walker. Uh, the minute we sat down, four lawyers were here, the minute we sat down, he said, you have no case because your cause was given away in 1951 by President Trump. You were not allowed to sue. The United States about 20 years ago had a big problem because we were trying to get uh, reciprocated payments to our POWs that were in Japan. Now, all those Japanese who were interned in the United States, as long as they were born here, the Congress approved that each one, child or adult, were given $20,000. And uh, for what they lost, there was not very much money to get for their losses in the United States. But uh, we never did get anything, and uh, uh, not that it matters anymore because we probably won't. But the thing is that uh, we, we have to go on and live our lives just like they are. And, and uh, uh, my wife and I at the present time we are, are doing fair, realizing that we do have each other and we live in our little cave. <laughs> <laughs> And we're happy and content there, and we find out, in spite of maybe two or three incidents in life that were not too pleasant for us, we now can look back and say we've had a good life. The only thing I can say is uh, uh, the only thing we have to think about now in our old age are side effects. Oh. <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> so I'll pass it on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 
There was a problem for many years of trying to get Japan to say they were sorry for mistreating our men so bad. And um, finally, uh, one of our people from the government came and said at one of our conventions that they were sorry, but it took a long many years to ever get someone to say from your government to say you were sorry for what all you had done to these poor men. But that's the way it goes. Thank you very much for <coughs> thank you very much for sharing your very intriguing account. Uh, and I think I guess uh, it must take a lot of courage to ch share this, this story with us. My name is Yoshi Nagamina. I work for the International Red Cross, and my predecessor uh, used to do many prison visits in Japan, and uh, for the improvement of the living condition of the POW in Japan. Uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Hare, you just uh, wonderfully uh, uh, share with us how the Japanese are polite to each other, how considered they are to each other. And then we hear the, the account of Johnson, Mr. Johnson uh, <coughs> telling about the pain and suffering he must have endured uh, in the Philippines. And we think, you know, he, we can't, and uh, it's, it's difficult to imagine that we are talking about the same people. <laughs> and my question is um, to Mr. Johnson, uh, how do you interpret, looking back at the past, um, how could a human being inflict such unnecessary suffering and pain to another human being? Uh, do you think it's a matter of culture? Um, is it because Japanese are simply bad people? Um, because they didn't know the, the Geneva Conventions? What, what, what was the feeling at your time, at that time? And what does, what, uh, how do you interpret now? Okay. Uh, how could this happen? Uh, the only answer I can give you is this. When I was in high school in Riverside, California, one of my mates in high school was a Japanese boy named Harold Shigataka Harada. Now, Harold's parents were East Side. They were born in Japan. His older brother was born in Japan. His father was a school teacher who came over to California and they settled in Riverside. The father, Jukichi, Harada opened a restaurant. His mother, Ken Harada, uh, ordered, uh, opened a rooming house just above the restaurant. So they worked very hard. They had several boys and a couple of girls. Uh, four of those young men either became an attorney, a dentist, or a doctor. They had their opportunity. But they still had to go to the relocation camps that we had on the west coast of the United States, and they weren't very nice. I'll be very honest with you, because I've got pictures at home. I've done a lot of research on those camps that they were in, and they really weren't too nice. They weren't any better than the prison camps that we were in, in Japan, about the same. So anyway, getting down to the brass tacks of everything, uh, I mean, someone may disagree with me, but that's all right, but I've done the research. Anyway, uh, what I would like to say is that uh, Harold, I, I became a prisoner of war of the Japanese on 10th May 1942 on the island of Mindanao. Harold Harada, the kid I went to high school with, became a prisoner of war of the, of the Americans 20 days later. Now I found that quite odd and I've contacted his sister, and uh, not sister, but his daughter, his oldest daughter is Kathleen. I just discovered her three weeks ago. And she's very anxious to get in touch with me again so we can discuss a little bit more about her father. So it works both ways when you look at it from a, a distance. Uh, there's nothing that can be done about the past right now. I am sorry that the Japanese felt that we didn't deserve something. But uh, uh, things are what they are and, and it turned out right. But uh, the only thing is that we learned, as being POWs, that in eight different camps that I was in during the time I was interned, we were used as grunt labor. We were put wherever the men used to be who were now soldiers, Japanese soldiers. 
And so I mean, this little thing goes on. In the United States, in the United States, we had Rosie the Riveter. A lot of women working in war, uh, war factories, building supplies and planes and boats and so forth, so that uh, we may have a possibility of winning the war. War is not a very pleasant thing. And uh, I'm not a true Christian, but I recall two passages in the Bible, and both of these are quotes from Jesus Christ. One of them was, the poor you shall have with you always. And the other one was, there will be wars and rumors of wars as long as man lives on this earth. And so there's something to think about there. And I thank you very much. Yes, uh, looking back at the past, uh, how do you interpret, how could the Japanese um, inflict such pain and suffering to other POWs? What is your explanation at that time and now? Uh, do you think because the Japanese didn't know the, the Geneva Conventions, do you think because it was the Japanese culture at that time? Do you think because due to education? Um, what is the interpretation of the bad, bad treatment of the POWs? What is I don't know, really know anything about the Geneva Convention. Urban, Urban, how do you account, Urban, how do you account for the Japanese behavior toward you fellows? How do you account for it? Well, one, one of the true comparative negligence is always a breakdown of. Uh, one way I can, I can account for it is that uh, the soldiers that came to uh, Manila and to Bataan had just come from fighting uh, and taking over the British in Singapore. And they were very uh, war-hardened uh, Japanese already. And uh, they just, uh, I, I guess they just kind of took it out on us uh, by having having been what they what they had to go through. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you very much. Right. May I have a comment? Hello. Uh, the point is the Bushido, the Sumerai, and the Pindi philosophy at that time. These men were considered less than human because they surrendered. Because at that time, the uh, Japanese government had convinced the people to die for the emperor. And we were less than human because we did surrender. Interestingly enough, actually, some, some Japanese who were taken prisoners by the Soviets who were then released in 1939 from Nomohan were ordered to commit suicide yes. uh, by the Japanese yes. army because they had because surrendered. The in, so. um, we've, we know you've had a very long day, and uh, Wakasugi san suggested we, we end up on 8, so it, it's around 8 o'clock. So we again would like really to thank you. Um, it's been an amazing evening. And we'd like to thank the foreign ministry for making the, this possible. And we'd like to thank Yuka. Where are you, Yuka? You're hiding? UK Buki. Uh, thanks to him, this has also been possible and she's worked very hard on this. So thank you very much. So, thank you again. Uh, if just uh, two, two housekeeping things. If you didn't get an invitation, uh, you can give us your business card, we'll put you on our list. And if you want to contribute to our events, we have our donation boxes, uh, which are like ballot boxes, but we're not asking for your votes. So for your cash. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 so,